Hello and welcome to Immigrantly, the podcast that creates a safe space for authentic storytelling. I am your host, Sadia Khan. Today we are diving headfirst into a topic that resonates with almost all of us, no matter where we come from or who we are. Love. So those of you who know me know that my journey led me to what some of you might label as love marriage. It was one of those love at first sight stories that they say only happen in movies, Hindi cinema maybe. And although my husband and I share strikingly similar backgrounds, the tale had a twist. My father, I call him Abu, initially opposed my decision. Can you believe it took me six months of cajoling, pleading, even a hunger strike and relentless battles to win him over? Throughout this grueling process, my steadfast ally was my mother. She believed in my choices and stood beside me offering unwavering support as I navigated this emotional roller coaster. Since then, my marriage has seen ebbs and flows, trials and tribulations and triumphs. But deep within me, I am convinced I autonomously made this choice, owning every facet of my decision without shifting blame elsewhere. But here's the twist that keeps me pondering. Why was the path so arduous in convincing my father? Why does the concept of a love marriage remain taboo in South Asian communities and society? While my love story didn't really culminate in some dramatic ending often seen in novels or movies, it's a reality that countless couples continue to grapple with. The struggle for the right to choose one's partner, the right to love freely and the right to carve our destinies persists. Today, we will peel back the layers of this intricate issue, exploring the cultural nuances, societal pressures and personal anecdotes that shape our perceptions of love marriage and autonomy. And guys, I have a perfect guest to unpack all of this with me. Mansi Choksi is a writer and journalist currently based in Dubai. Her talent with words and engaging stories is nothing short of amazing. Her work has appeared in the New York Times, the New Yorker and National Geographic, just to name a few. She's also the author of The Newlyweds, which came out last year. This book is an exploration of love marriage in modern India. Most recently, she's been a guest host on the final season of NPR's Rough Translation. This most recent season is titled Love Commandos, which basically explores the risky territory of love marriages in India, where about 95% of marriages are arranged. Now, NPR's Love Commandos actually follows a group fighting to protect love marriages, or so it seems. Okay, I want to give Mansi the space to explain more, so I won't give too much away. But let's just say we might be crossing into some controversial territory. But hey, if you are not pushing boundaries on immigrant leave, then I am probably not doing my job right. I am so excited to get this conversation going. So let's welcome Mansi. I am so excited to have you here, virtually, of course. Thank you for having me. <laughs> <laughs> so you're based in Dubai, right? I'm based in Dubai, yes. So tell me, how have you been? 
I've been good. Thank you. How have you been? I've been good. I've been thinking a lot about love and arranged marriages as I was doing preparation for this interview. But before we get into all of that, Love Commandos, your book, The Newlyweds, I've been thinking a lot about people and how they exist outside the work, especially journalists whose work basically is storytelling. And the storytelling almost reflects their identity in some ways. But talk to me about who Mansi is, something that isn't visible to other people through your work. Yeah, so a big part of my identity, my new identity is being a mom. I have a three-year-old, almost four-year-old, um, so large parts of my day are spent uh, guided by his curiosity as opposed to only my curiosity. I'm really sorry, can you hear that? He is crying in the background and I'm worried that it's disturbing the audio. I think it's fine. I mean, if people hear him crying in the background, then they know there's a baby in the house, you know, there's a toddler, right? <laughs> Why not? Yeah, there is a baby in the house. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, a big part of... Uh, um, my, you know, new identity is being a mom to him. And I think that, um, you know, in the early days of becoming a new mom, there's these long periods of nothingness when you've just given birth. It's a very isolating experience. You know, you're breastfeeding, you're chained to uh, a breast pump, if that's what you choose for yourself. And those hours are long. For me, they were pretty like anxious hours because, you know, as this new version of myself was being built, I really worried about losing old parts of myself. And I feel like those early months, like really in some ways made me a better writer. A big part of uh, my book was written uh, after I gave birth. And it was written in these like long hours of breastfeeding and trying to put him to bed and waiting for sleep to come and trying to figure out what this whole new role was about. And um, at that time, I was just really anxious about like forgetting that now that I'm a mom, like a central part of my identity has been being a journalist and a writer. And I was so desperate to like hold on to that old part of myself that I fought really hard for it. And now, uh, you know, now like four years have passed and I'm starting to grasp that actually it's been a it's been quite a gift because I think once you become a mom, as a writer, like you start to realize that the time you spend away from being a parent has to really be worth it in some ways. It has to be really something that you love. And also it's like, I think it made me like a more present writer because, you know, like before I had all the time in the world and I had like nothing but uh, this to to do for myself and um, with that came a lot of the um, you know the the fancies around oh I don't feel like writing now I don't like I'm not in the mood it's not like ah. flowing uh, and now you just don't have those luxuries anymore because it's like okay you have 15 minutes you you do this now or this book doesn't get written so this was a long winding answer to your question <laughs> <laughs> this is so interesting Mansi, because I had both my girls early on in my 20s in fact and I am in my 40s now and both of them are off to college wow which is so incredible right and I was talking to one of my friends and I was like I don't remember the time when I was alone and I could do whatever I wanted and yeah. I'm trying to reconnect with my younger self in my early 20s and see right. what what it was like to be alone and be out and about and not worry about kids and school and homework and activities. Right. So you're right. It's so interesting that you grappled with that. And I grappled with it in ways that I can't even explain. In my 20s, I was angry. I was a young yeah. mom. I didn't want to have kids at the time. We still had kids. I don't know why. <laughs> but now when I look back, I can't see my life without them. And yeah. I'm feeling anxious because I will have to, you know, relearn how to live without them. Yeah. But I want to go back to what you said about losing parts of your identity. What parts of your identity, other than your work, mm -hmm. did you fear losing? You know, just like remnants of my old self that was, you know, sort of didn't have a care in the world except for my myself. And now I have a responsibility and, you know, somebody is entirely dependent on me. Their growth and their, their thriving and flourishing has a lot to do with um, 
what I do for them and how much of myself I'm able to give to them. I think that culturally and also like in general, I think we really, really like glorify the role of motherhood, but like we don't yeah. talk enough about how hard it is and you know what a what an internal churning it is for young women like up until the point i became a mom i had was i was living under the delusion that like i was a different kind of woman and i would i had all these choices i mean i would always be the center of my world because that's how i had lived most of my life and then and then something happens and you're not the only one you're thinking about it's a, it's, yeah. it's a real like learning experience and it's um you know it's a humbling experience i think it opens up a part of you that is just so incredibly vulnerable right. in so many ways like it makes you so weak and fragile that um i feel like in in some ways it also makes you a better writer <laughs> <laughs> what's it talking about culture oh my gosh us as two south asian women are in this space and how can we not talk about culture right right it's so ubiquitous it's yeah. so ingrained in our psyche and i want to start with love commandos yes paint me a picture of that love story it's like romeo and juliet she's 15 and he's nearly 17 They date in secret. Love is a beautiful feeling. She says suddenly every song was about us. Every Bollywood song was about us. That is love. That is the trust. NPR's series Rough Translation ended on this season of something called Love Commandos and you guest host that. Talk to me about how did this collaboration happen yeah so actually my interest in the love commandos began in 2016 actually began in 2012 when satyamev jayate the show that we talk about in episode 1 started so satyamev jayate is in some ways india's version of the oprah show it's like a news talk show like it's a it's it, it's like a non fiction talk show program where you have a celebrity actor hosting and introducing an issue from like various perspectives so the show is hosted by Amir Khan who's you know one of the biggest names in bollywood um, you know he was one of the classic romance heroes of the 90s and he shot to like incredible fame and you know then he acquired this like intellectual persona and um, he hosts this show And when it first came out, you know, it was a really big deal. It came on primetime TV, like where the soaps and the movies came. So it had a different kind of audience from like the news shows. And it was a kind of show that was supposed to kind of like shake up your moral conscience. Um, you know, it was supposed to take important issues to people that were generally seen as politically apathetic or were not engaged in political matters. It was supposed to be a show for them to enlighten them about the big issues that were shaping India. and um, one of the shows was about intolerance to love and you know it it basically like provided a portrayal of you know all the obstacles that young indians face when they choose love marriage the most extreme is obviously a crime and honor killing but on the lower end of the spectrum it's you know a sentence of a lifetime of guilt and shame and parental disapproval and in that show satyamev jayate one of the people that they interviewed was this man sanjay sachdev and when he came on the show he was representing uh, the ngo love commandos which is a group of self-styled vigilantes who promise to protect young people who run away for love mm. love commandos D- duniya ka ikalota chatha voluntary initiative ji 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 and you know he promises shelter and legal aid and promises to help them get married and the thing about this guy is that he is super fascinating okay the way that he carries himself on like he comes on air with this charisma in a sense you know he is able to quote like galib on one hand and like quote supreme court <laughs> judgments on the other and you're just like wow what a great speaker and then you know the way he carries himself he's wearing like a nehru hand spun jacket um you know he looks like the freedom fighters from you know the independence movement and you just feel like he has this like big cause behind him and he's like a grassroots guy 
and um i i, I saw him and i was like wow this is this could be like this is so cool that this exists mm-hmm. and i I'd, i'd been keeping an eye on it for a little bit and then i had an assignment for harper's magazine to 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 do a deep dive on the love commando so that's where it started i went to delhi hung out with them a little bit and then you know when i first started you know it felt that i was you know telling a story about middle aged men that are putting themselves at great risk for the cause of young lovers but obviously as i spent more and more time with them it turned out that the reality was something else altogether so that piece came out it finally grew into a book called the newlyweds and now this is like the third avatar with npr's rough translation once i have listened to all the episodes and yeah, i was okay. blown away it's such an interesting intriguing conversation and i don't want to give away too much but the story does take a sinister turn right something yeah. happens and then you're like oh my gosh why this because everybody is rooting for those young couples and right. for love commandos although i will admit the name just seems so performative to me love commandos i mean it is a clickbaity name there's no doubt about right. it but yeah of course it's performative and everything about them is performative they have like a little anthem for the love commandos they're over the top and that's like part of their charm subtlety is not one of their strong suits <laughs> where i stood inside a bedroom where a young woman and her husband uh, were killed by the girl's family they were from two different castes her family had never accepted them and uh, you know the woman was pregnant um had been shot to death in their sleep for running away 5 years earlier throughout the conversation in almost every episode and i just started reading your book the newlyweds even in your book caste pops up a lot right a lot yes. of times people in india prefer or they prioritize marrying within the same caste because if they don't they could be ostracized they could be killed they could be harassed right something similar happens in pakistan but not to the same degree because yeah. growing up my perception of arranged marriage was ah uh, i don't think i will be in an arranged marriage but it's not bad like a mm-hmm. lot of people have benefited from it right but we see that in india especially this tradition that's rooted in you know centuries old legacy is weaponized to maintain and dominate certain caste hierarchies yeah. and control people right and i was reading your book and there are so many interesting stories mm-hmm. about neetu and the vinder or story about preeti and reshma and arif right. monica but you know what really stood out to me is that despite the fact that they run away for love and this is you know their heroic rebellious act they still internalize a lot of what they are conditioned to believe in in terms of hierarchy absolutely mansi how does that influence what these couples go through and how does the whole notion of pursuing love and aftermaths alter based on how they still perceive their identities in relation to their partner's identities yeah i think that all these years of reporting have taught me one thing that while these young people end up being poster figures for love as an act of subversion as you rightly said we're a product of our own conditioning and biases that we internalize growing up in a society where caste and class structures are so deeply entrenched in like day to day life that while the poster heads they're not exactly believing those things so for instance in my book i follow arif and monica uh monica is from a wealthy hindu family arif is from a very lower middle class uh, muslim family uh, he is trying you know to break into a government job because that would mean like lifetime of stability etc and while monica is in love with him they run away they, she wants a life with him in her mind she has still been born into a higher place in society so while she's able to accept arif she really struggles with embracing the rest of his family um the way that she describes arif's mom for instance is the sense that arif's mother had like an empty stomach stench coming from her breath it's just so poor mm. it basically is just so irksome to to monica in many ways or the fact that you know when she moves into this village in rural maharashtra she is able to 
relate more with the other Maharashtrian women that are Hindu and upper caste more than her, you know, in-laws, because that's the strata that she should be mingling in. Similarly with Neetu and Davinder, uh, Neetu belongs to a slightly marginally higher caste um, than Davinder, but she still carries a chip on her shoulder about that. They have a child and, you know, she's very insistent that he belongs to her caste. Mm. Even though she, you know, her parents have like disowned her, they will no longer talk to her. You know, she has that like, you know, that he's mixed and he's got part of this like lineage in him. I mean, with Reshma and Preeti, it was a different thing because they were uh, they were cousins, second cousins. But, um, you know, we have the sense that when a couple runs away, they're they're doing something because they believe that love is a force that can bridge these divides of caste and class and religion, community, language, clan. But it's one part of it. We as South Asian people derive our identity from the various groups that we belong to. Hmm. And our lives are so intertwined into like our family structure that it's impossible to erase all those other aspects of ourselves through the lens of this one act. Yeah, yeah. This is such an important point because... A lot of times people fall in love because they fall in love. It's not a rebellious act. They are not thinking through all of it, right? Right. When I fell in love with my now husband, we have very similar backgrounds. And yet my Abu opposed my decision. It took me six months of convincing, right? Yeah. And I never understood why. Like our backgrounds were similar. And then it really came to me, I was like, maybe because he felt at the time that I took away his right to choose a life partner for his daughter. Yeah. Which is so convoluted. It is so crazy. But that's how South Asian families are structured. We come from a collectivist society. Familial bonds are so strong. It's almost impossible to break away from it and I am in awe of all these couples because when I look back and I think back to how I was feeling I didn't have a plan b I didn't have a plan c I was not going to run away the stakes were too high the only option I had was to convince my appu that was the only option and even my husband now now my husband would never have done that, which sometimes makes me even sad because <laughs> I'm like, what if it hadn't happened? But it's also important to recognize that these one-off events, although heroic and rebellious, until this happens in form of a critical mass, we are not enacting change. There is nothing drastic happening structurally and systemically. So talk to me, Mansi, how does that systemic change come about? I think the answer is in the question that you asked, which is the reason this is not a systemic change is because we as a generation, even though we're a unique generation, we grew up after India liberalized, our lives look so different from our parents or grandparents' generation. But the point is that young Indians conduct our lives based on the approval and disapproval of our parents, we have such a deep sense of filial duty and our lives are so intertwined economically, socially, financially, especially. I mean, these are young people that have never made a choice for themselves up until this point of choosing who to marry. They have been told what to wear, what to do, what to eat, what career paths to choose, who to hang out with, how to spend their time. They're not rebels. They're exactly the kinds of young Indians that are trained to grow within the boundaries of traditional Indian society. So I think societal change comes if if the Indian family structure changes and actually allows for young people to to flourish and thrive and, you know, allow them to leave their home and become independent and accountable for their own actions and choices. None of the decisions we make as young people have consequences for us and they have consequences for the whole family, right? Like there's there's nothing that I have done in my life until I'm married. And there's not a single act that I would have to pay for alone without the protection of my family. There's nothing that I've ever had to be accountable for because I've always like I am just one peg in like this, like one tool in this large unit. I'm just one part of it. So I think that until like young people leave their homes, start their own lives together and are independent financially and emotionally, they they were just talking about anecdotal like things. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. 
tired of those late night thoughts racing through your mind, disrupting your sleep? Well, we've all been there. Just as you're about to drift off, your mind decides it's time for a brainstorming session, right? It's happened to me so many times. But guess what? There's a powerful way to silence those mental marathons. That's right. Talking it out can work wonders. And where's the best place to do that? Therapy. Therapy offers you a safe space to unravel those racing thoughts, break free from negative cycles and discover the serenity you deserve. Your mind will thank you and so will your well-rested self. So, if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible and suited to your schedule. Get a break from your thoughts with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash immigrantly today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp.com slash immigrantly. Once you talk about your mom's journey in your book mm. in the beginning, but I am more curious to know how that impacted your own understanding around love and perception of love and how did you partake in your love journey yeah you know what of course like one one reason that I was interested in this at all is because you know this has always been a question that has kind of like followed me everywhere I go the you know the the central question of where did I come from and had I not been in this world had this um, relationship um, not taken off and also like my my childhood has um, has been different from the childhood of like my friends and other family members because I didn't have a dad that is also a direct consequence of the fact that this was a, a marriage that just went downhill a lot of like the central questions of of who I am and why I exist cut deep into this idea of uh, whether um, love is an act of rebellion and is it worth it? So is it worth it? I mean, I feel like the answer varies for different people. Like for my mom, I think that when she looks at it now, the answer is well, it's worth it because now she has a life of that's of her own making. She has, you know, two children that she's proud of. Um, she has a life she's proud of. So in her mind now, yes, it's worth it. If you asked her while she was in the midst of all of this, she would have surely said it's not worth it. So I think it's really a question of uh, where you are in your own like journey. The, and the, the, the answer is like not static. To me, one, one, one aspect of it is that I'm a product of this kind of like forbidden marriage. And B, I'm also a kid that grew up on cable television. And I'm a kid that grew up with all the crappy Hindi movies that some <laughs> guy in my neighborhood was playing all day long. And I watched it and they really defined my worldview. Oh my gosh, Hindi cinema is so integral in yeah. shaping minds of South Asians about love and perception of love. What, Chumka? Right, exactly, 100%. I have to admit that the movies that I grew up on really defined the way that um, I conduct my life and love affairs. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> it defined my ideas of uh, of love and whether, you know, how, whether love was uh, something worth fighting for or not. And because I grew up in the 90s when, you know, cable television had just been introduced into India, uh, there were just a handful of films that the, the cable operators got their hands on and they would play them on repeat. <laughs> so those were the films that, um, you know, have a special place in my mind uh, and heart, actually. Mansi, you also intentionally decided to focus on working class young couples. Yes. And I am curious to know if you were to replicate this and interview or follow couples from either middle or upper middle class. In your opinion, how would things look similar or different? There was no deliberate choice, honestly, with the way that the couples were chosen. It, I met Neetu and Devinder at the Love Commando shelter and I, and I instantly fell in love with them. The reason I did, because I think that they summed up something about small town Indian aspiration that I just found, it was just so raw, authentic and honest. 
that I just I, honestly I just fell in love with Neetu. She was hilarious. Imagine you have this girl who's run away. She's she's planning her elopement for weeks, and she's like carefully packed four bags with like friendship <laughs> bands and uh, f- uh, photo albums. And I just thought it was just so hilarious that the the way that she like went about this uh, very serious decision in her life. She did some prep work for it, right? Yeah, yeah. And she like, um, yeah, and she's like completely like deadpan about the way that she, uh, what I love about her is also that she sees herself as like the lead in a Bollywood movie that no one is like filming. And I just, I, I found that so relatable. Neetu and Devinder was how this book began anyway. So they were, they were in place. When I started the book project, I wanted to write a book that not only told the stories of like what's at stake when young people choose love, but I wanted each of their stories to say something about how India's changing. So the reason I chose Arif and Monica is because it was a way for me to explore India's lurch to the right and the rise of Hindu nationalism through this idea of love jihad that, you know, we're hearing so much about in the news, but nobody had really done a deep dive into what it means for the lives of ordinary people who suddenly find themselves entangled in this like massive political controversy they have nothing to do with. Hmm. So that's how I landed on Arif and Monica. And the reason I chose Reshma and Preeti is because I felt that there was a there was a real overrepresentation of the stories of um, urban gay men in the LGBTQ narrative and um, the discourse around Section 377. And um, not enough literature or storytelling had been done around the lives of working class lesbian women, lesbian women that were a not protected by the powers of privilege and money, but also were had so much at stake. These are these are young women. They don't have the vocabulary to describe the feelings they're feeling for each other. They they don't know the the they don't they're not part of the equal rights movement in mm. India. They're just people feeling something that they know is a dirty thing um, in the minds of their their loved ones. But they have the audacity to really go after a life that is authentic and full and free. Reshma and Preeti, to me, are the most fascinating characters because they're, yeah, just absolutely so brave. And no one else in the book has the kind of stakes up against them as these two women do. Mansi, can you explain Section 377 for people who don't know? Absolutely. Yeah, so Section 377 is a colonial era law that was introduced by British lawmakers when uh, India was occupied by the British um, that equated homosexuality with bestiality and sodomy. It criminalized homosexuality as an act that was uh, morally corrupt. Initially, this act was introduced so that um, British soldiers would not be corrupted by the morally lax norms of you know native societies Mm. and obviously you know the indian penal code is based a lot on um, the laws that were introduced by the british and when the british left we held on to this idea of section 377 really preciously in in some ways as with a lot of colonized societies our ideas of who we are get meshed and mashed with uh, our colonizers versions of what's good and what's bad even though Indian mythology, Indian, you know, spirituality has always brimmed with colorful concepts of, you know, um, transgender life. And uh, in Hindu mythology, the concept of spirits flowing in and out of gendered bodies, gods and deities taking lovers of the same sex. These are not like new ideas, you know, they're very much in uh, Indian mm. culture. But yeah, we we started to, you know, we, we put our nose up the way that the British did when they first came across <laughs> it. And then it became a marker of uh, sophistication um, to feel that homophobia was something that was anti-Indian. I think that we as a young, not a young society, an ancient civilization, but a newly independent nation, trying to understand what it means to be modern. I think we as a country really struggled with what does it mean to be modern? Does being modern mean being not ancient? Does being modern mean being more like the British? What does being modern mean? So like we are arriving at our own versions of this idea without really quite knowing where we're going. And yeah, and I think like uh, homophobia was one of the the fallouts of that. Mm. And Section 377, it's you know, there's been a long fight in India to decriminalize homosexuality. And um, I think it was in 20 20- that the law was struck down and uh, it was finally no longer a crime to be a homosexual person in India. The Supreme Court today partially struck down Section 377 that it will not apply to consensual same-sex acts between homosexuals, heterosexuals and lesbians. 
But what that means is very little for people like Reshma and Preeti because one is what the law says and the other right. is what the lived experience is, right? Or what the society dictates, right? Exactly. So like um, Reshma's parents don't really care whether homo- th- Section 377 is now struck down. Now, Reshma's parents are still ashamed of the fact that, um, you know, she is a woman that loves women. I, I chose Reshma and Preeti to, I think, fill in a-, a gap that I had perceived. I hadn't read enough about um, lesbian working class women. Auntie, most of what you and I are talking about right now hinges on true love, love, love of any kind, right? Yeah. How do you define true love? Do you have a definition? I don't have a definition, but I think I know what it feels like. I think I can recognize it in the sense that I think true love looks like peace. It looks like acceptance. And, you know, true love is different from from new love and lust and obsession and crushing and all the all the other things because i think those those things are marked by like a you know like the the fastening of the heartbeat or like the butterflies in the stomach and those ideas that we borrow from like pop culture of what love looks like i think it's the opposite of that i think true love hmm. looks like comfortable silences it looks like peace it looks like um fighting and um and arguing in constructive ways and uh, it looks like listening it looks like an adult, mature relationship of equals. And true love can be messy. It's full of disagreements as well. And it's full of... It is. <laughs> yeah, it's full of disagreements. And it's also um, full of like changing. Because once, uh, you know, I feel like it's about growing up and growing together in some ways. I think it's about uh, making room for the person that you love to change and evolve and grow. Uh, even, ac- you know, growing to grow things that uh, you may not like about them. But mm. I think it's about creating that space for growth. Right. So, Mansi, when I listened to Love Commandos and I started reading your book, it really impacted me in ways where I started looking at arranged marriage differently. And I'll give you an example. So recently I did an episode and had conversations around arranged marriage where I was trying to, in a way, destigmatize it, yeah. not in ways where I think it's better or it's not problematic, but I sometimes feel that the American society or people in the US look at it in a very one dimensional manner. So I was trying to add more nuance. And our team posted this TikTok video where we compare arranged marriages to dating apps. And we're like, oh, in one, you know, you're letting algorithm pick and in the other, you're letting your parents pick. And then I had this follower I believe from India, comment on that TikTok and I will read that to you. And I want to get your feedback on it or your take on it. This is what the followers said and I quote, Marriages in South Asia continue to be heavily defined by caste, class and religion. Stepping out can mean risking life, honor killings or just being disowned by families. I thought this space, referring to immigrantly, was different in terms of the lens on arranged marriages until now. Why do we need to celebrate and affirm any institution which is so regressive? What do we really celebrate in South Asian weddings under the garb of glitter and glow? And it really got me thinking because she has a point in the context of Love Commandos and I wonder if it is still worth having a more nuanced conversation about arranged marriages, not to celebrate, but just to have a different perspective? Or do you think the institution or the concept itself is too regressive to exist? I do tend to agree because the way that arranged marriages are organized, you don't you don't think about compatibility as much as you think about community and caste and subgroups and identity like your parents when they're finding a match for you they're not thinking about whether you guys share the same hobbies that's a plus right but when the bio datas are being matched what's really being matched is you know the gotra and the the caste and the class and um, education levels to some degree so that this couple can have a conversation but yeah i think in general the concept of matchmaking of like arranged marriage making is a pretty regressive practice because it's done with the sole purpose of strengthening power structures. So you want an upper caste person to marry an upper caste person Mm. so that 
power is consolidated in that upper caste structure. You don't want an upper caste person to marry a lower caste person because you're weakening that power structure or you're creating mobility for a lower caste person to enter a new community. So I think, yeah, I think by definition, it's a regressive practice. And in general, I feel like South Asian young people need to just make choices for ourselves. Like we mm. just need to do mm. shit by ourselves now. <laughs> <laughs> you're right. You're right. And when I think about my marriage, I've had ebbs and flows, trials and tribulations, but I own every part of it. The right. good, the bad and the ugly. Right. I don't blame my parents. I don't blame the community. Absolutely. Whatever choices I made at the time have manifested in various forms. And I'm okay with that. Right, right. But you know, what really surprised me was also maybe some degree or differences that exist between arranged marriages in Pakistan versus in India. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I wasn't fully aware of, because I was looking at arranged marriages solely through that vantage point. Yeah. Although there have been a lot of problematic things happening in Pakistan as well. But what I'm trying to say is that sometimes it's important to look at a practice or tradition more holistically and not how it has interacted with you or your family members. And this is yeah. a great example of that, right? So right, right. I have become more aware of yeah. the regressive or the harmful impact of arranged marriages, especially in India. But Mansi, what is the way forward? We see this tug of war between tradition and modernity. Yeah. What is the middle ground? I think, um, yeah, I really think the middle ground is, you know, for more young people to get an education, join the workforce, especially women to not drop out of the workforce and not think of marriage as like the final destination or like the ultimate outcome of like being born and growing up. I think that would be a starting point, right? Because I feel like we as young women, uh, uh, it's almost as if this is our job just to like grow up and like be a bride to somebody and um, and for us for our generation I think what changed is that uh, we were finally expected to also have flourishing careers but um, once you have a flourishing career the, the weird thing is that the other expectation doesn't disappear that it's like okay have a career have everything but also this is also your primary role hmm. <laughs> so I want yeah I mean I feel like more and more people are like making choices for themselves which is a which is a good thing yeah but at the same time as you mentioned a lot of young people in India the survey that you did also show that they still believe in the sanctity of tradition and marrying within the same caste yeah. or marrying within the same religion so it makes me think where is the progress then? Yeah, I struggled with the same thing. I honestly don't know. It's not even like a singular voice. I wish I had a clearer understanding, but I really do not. It's so different. Like, you know, when you think about a young person in, in a big city or even a tier two city and you think about like a, a young person in a village in Bihar, for instance, uh, the, their, their worldviews are so different. What they want from life and the stakes are so, so are so high. I think it's hard to talk about all of them as one I one unit because it's they're not, right? Yeah. And it's unfair to make a judgment on them, right? To make a judgment about oh, why do they want to stay within the same caste? Because right, we have exactly. to think about the broader society, the structure, systems that exist within that society and what Absolutely. they facilitate and what they hamper. So it's easier for somebody sitting in the U.S. to make all those judgments. By the way, I remember I was doing a research for one of my articles and I came across this Pew research where it indicated that if we look at different racial identities within the U.S., most white folks marry or prefer to marry within their own race. Yeah. So sometimes we think about, you know, this is happening in India or Pakistan and somehow those societies are regressive or, you know, those societies are more traditional. Right. But a lot of times, a lot of those things are happening in the U.S. Right. as well. I'm absolutely well. not surprised to, to hear about those findings. Right. So it's like, oh, my gosh, even the U.S. has those preferences in order to basically reassert those racial hierarchies that exist. Exactly, right. Mansi, I am curious about Love Commandos. What's the group doing now and where's the founder? He's around. He is back to business. The shelter's running. Yeah, he's back to business. Everything's okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Mansi, in the end, I normally ask my guests to define America, but I will 
tweak it a bit. I'll ask you to define India. Yeah. In a word or a sentence based on your work and based on where India is right now. In my mind, India is inclusive. That's what comes to my mind when I think about India. I think about inclusivity and diversity. But from my reporting, the word that comes to my mind is India is changing. India mm. is growing. India is also also shrinking in in these ideas of um, inclusivity and diversity it's a, it's a, it can be a scary place to to be um, a person of uh, any kind of minority mm. i mean mm. when i think of india i think about the india of my childhood the india uh, that i i grew up in uh, which was uh, a free place a place where everybody um, had equal stake in its rise and fall a place um, that belonged to everyone equally and now i think about india as one india becoming um uh, more small minded but also india galloping towards the future mm, mm that's true that's true once you where can people find love commandos where can they find your book yeah my book is everywhere uh, across the us um you'll find it at any indie store or any of the you know the big barnes and nobles it's on amazon it was published by atria books um simon and schuster in the us um and yeah it's freely available everywhere uh, there's a kindle edition as well there's an audible edition and uh the npr series that that is also um wherever you get your podcasts on spotify on apple um on the npr channel on embedded um it's everywhere please have a listen um i think you'll like it you love it you love yeah. it <laughs> thank you so much vansi this was thank so good thank you for good. having me thank you so much i really enjoyed this conversation thank you Oh my god this was so much fun and by the way Mansi and I also talked about the new Hindi movie Rocky or Rani ki prem kahani we'll put that conversation most likely on our Patreon or Instagram somewhere so be on a lookout for that it was a lot of fun I am so glad Mansi and I were able to have this conversation guys I really think that my understanding of arranged marriage has evolved through this process by interviewing mansi by one of our followers post which really spoke to me and you know what what good is a platform if it's not introspective and reflective anyways this episode was produced by me sadia khan written by mikaela strather and me the editorial review was done by shay yu Our editor for this episode is Paroma Chakravarti. Our theme music is by Simon Hutchinson. Don't forget to follow us on our social media platforms: TikTok at Immigrantly Podcast, Instagram at Immigrantly Pod, Twitter at Immigrantly underscore Pod. You can follow me on Twitter at S W K. K H A N I know it's confusing but don't forget to follow me and if you have questions ping me write to me would love to hear your thoughts especially on this topic and if you've been in an arranged marriage or love marriage and if you are from south asia talk to us what are your thoughts until next time take care